Good morning, everyone. This is Faye Hanley-Brown. I'm a Managing Director at FSG, and we're excited to welcome you to our webinar, Collective Impact, Implementing Shared Measurement. We have two fantastic panelists joining us today, Patricia Bowie, who is a consultant with the Magnolia Place Community Initiative, and Tim Richter, who is the President and CEO of the Calgary Homeless Foundation. They're going to talk about their experiences with implementing shared measurement systems as part of their Collective Impact projects. We have over 250 uh, folks registered and participating today on the webinar, and we will be tweeting with hashtag Collective Impact if you'd like to tweet along with us. Next slide, please. So first, I want to give a quick introduction about FSG. We're a global nonprofit that provides strategy consulting, evaluation, and research to clients around the world. An important part of our work is to share what we're learning on the ground with the larger field, and we've published articles and white papers about a range of topics, including collective impact and shared measurement. We were started in 2000 by Harvard professor Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, and we now work across all sectors to help organizations to solve social problems. Increasingly, that means working with clients on cross-sector collective impact projects like the ones you'll hear about today. Next slide, please. We're looking forward to a good conversation with our panelists today, and we will leave time for Q&A with you, our audience. You can enter your questions at any time by typing your question into the box on the lower left part of your screen. We won't be able to answer all of the questions, but we will try to get to as many as possible, especially the questions that broadly reflect the themes that we're seeing from all of you. And we're very excited to hear from you, so please, please do put questions in. I know that most of you are already familiar with the concepts of collective impact from the Stanford Social Innovation Review article. And for this webinar, we want to concentrate on shared measurement, which is a key component of collective impact. For our agenda today, I will start us off briefly by recapping the concepts of collective impact and shared measurement. And we'll then get into some real life case examples from our panelists around how to develop and use shared measurement systems. Tim Richter from the Calgary Homeless Foundation will talk us through um, how they work closely with many stakeholders in Calgary to develop a set of common measures that everyone bought into around homelessness. And we'll then hear from Pat Bowie from the Magnolia Place Community Initiative about how once stakeholders have agreed to a common set of measures, they can then use those measures and that data to learn and improve over time. And we'll then have an opportunity to answer some of your questions about this important topic. Next slide, please. Before we talk about measurement, it's important to talk about the types of problems we're trying to solve and what we're trying to measure. In the social sector, there are three different types of problems. There are simple problems like baking a cake, where with a little experimentation, you can get to the right recipe. And once you've got that recipe, replication will get you to nearly the same result every time. There are also complicated problems, like sending a man to the moon, which clearly require high levels of expertise and training, but there is a technical solution to these problems that can be repeated over time with the expectation of success. And then there are complex problems, like raising a child, where there are simply no recipes. There are many outside factors that influence these problems, and every situation is unique. There is simply no guarantee of success. And what we see is that the social sector often treats problems as simple or complicated, but in fact, they are highly complex. Take any complex social issue of our times, poverty reduction, access to health care, watershed restoration, economic development. We've really failed to find the answers to how we achieve positive and consistent large-scale progress. We've been able to achieve success in one school, maybe one neighborhood, one community clinic, but for the most part, large-scale change has really proved elusive. Next slide. So really what we find then is that the traditional ways of approaching social change are not working. We've lived with the same paradigm in the social sector for 50 years now. And it goes something like this, pilot, prove, replicate. We pilot a program or an organization. We work hard to prove that it works, often using randomized control trials. And then we replicate that uh, intervention or organization in other places. And the problem is that in many cases, that approach just doesn't work. It rests on a number of assumptions that don't always hold. It assumes that what works in one place will work as well in another. 
It assumes that the answer comes from scaling a single organizational model. It assumes that leadership can be replicated, and clearly we've seen that. Uh, an example is the Harlan Children's Zone. We've seen how hard that is to replicate with, without someone like Jeffrey Canada at the helm. And it also assumes the need for new resources instead of using our current resources more effectively. So essentially this puts funders in the position of having to pick winners and nonprofits in the position of having to compete with one another instead of collaborating. And this really leads to what we believe to be the single largest obstacle to social change, isolated impact, that essentially each organization and funder has their own theory of change and a solution for how to solve problems. We've invested huge amounts of resources against our society's largest problems, and in many cases we haven't been able to move the needle. But there is a different way to approach social problems that treats them not as simple or complicated, but as complex. And we call this collective impact. And it's not collaboration, it's not partnership, it's something much more specific than that, uh, where essentially you have multiple organizations working toward the same goal and measuring the same things, which is really the focus of our conversation today. And you also have actors working across sectors, nonprofits, government, philanthropy, corporations, all coordinating their actions, sharing their lessons learned, and really continuously improving. So this is fundamentally about systems change. Next slide, please. In the Stanford Social Innovation Review article about collective impact, my colleagues John Kenya and Mark Kramer outlined five key components for collective impact. Common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and a backbone organization. Now, while all those components are critical for collective impact, we've heard from practitioners that shared measurement is one of the most difficult to achieve, uh, and one of the reasons we really wanted to focus this webinar on that topic today. And when I say shared measurement, what I mean is essentially identifying a targeted set of indicators that everyone signs onto and pursues, and then using that data both to track progress but also to improve efforts over time. This is very different from the traditional paradigm of evaluation that we see in the field, which typically focuses on isolating the impact of a single organization or of a single grant, rather than assessing the impact of multiple organizations working together to solve a common problem. Now, clearly there are many challenges to shared measurement. Getting to agreement on common measures with competing priorities among individual organizations, even the fear that organizations will be compared. There's also limited capacity for data collection and analysis within organizations. And it's a lot of time and cost to develop a shared measurement system. But the benefits are significant, and they include improved data quality, uh, leading to greater alignment across organizations and the ability to track progress toward a shared goal, more collaborative problem solving, and really informing learning that benefits all the participants that are working to solve a problem and allow for course correction that leads to better results. Even catalyzing action. What we've seen in some cases that, is that simply having the data in a public space and highlighting the problem can catalyze organizations to take action or can be used as a powerful tool for advocacy. Next slide, please. So we've been talking about what shared measurement is, and I'd, I'd like now to segue to how you put something like this into place. There are three phases that we've seen to developing a shared measurement system, designing, developing, and deploying. And for today's discussion, we'd really like to focus in on two areas in particular. The first is designing shared measures. So how do you go from lots of different organizations measuring their own performance in different ways to using a common set of measures to track progress towards shared goals? Tim Richter from the Calgary Homeless Foundation will really focus on this on his, in his comments and talk about how in Calgary they were able to go from what was literally 10,000 different measures around homelessness to a set of eight that everyone in the community could get around and agree to. The second part of shared measurement systems that we wanted to focus on today is really around deploying or the use of shared measurement. So once the shared measures are in place and you've got all the stakeholders agreeing to those measures, how do you actually use the data to increase impact? Data by itself is just data, but how do you use it to inform action? And Pat Bowie from the Magnolia Place uh, Initiative is going to discuss how they've been able to use data in their own work in LA. Next slide, please. 
So as we've looked across multiple examples of shared measurement systems, there are a number of key success factors that we've found are in place uh, for organizations and groups that are able to put shared measurement uh, in place. One is, is clearly around funding. It's really important to have strong leadership and substantial funding to put a shared measurement in place, and ideally from the beginning. Um, it's also important, however, that while you have a funder or funders involved, that the system is developed by multiple stakeholders and not just by an individual funder or funders. The second key success factor that we've seen is really around broad and open engagement. And this is true both in the design process, where it's really critical to get multiple stakeholders to weigh in on what the right measures are, but also once the system is in place. So really having voluntary participation open to all organizations that are working on an issue um, so that they can be a part of this process. The third key success factor that we've seen is really around infrastructure. Um, the use of web-based technology is really helpful. Uh, and we'll be talking about that a little bit, particularly in, in Calgary's case in their HMIS system. But even more important than technology is the staffing and the ongoing support for training and facilitation around a shared measurement system, which really leads me to that, the last set of key success factors around learning. There's an important focus on continually improving the system itself. So how do you make the system more useful? How do you make sure that the measures are the right ones? But what's really critical for using shared measurement in a collective impact comp context is having a facilitated process for participants to learn from one another. And this is often a role that's played by the backbone organization. And again, Pat um, from the uh, Magnolia Place Initiative will be talking a lot about how they've been able to put facilitated processes like this in place for their effort in Los Angeles. So with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Tim um, from the Calgary Homeless Foundation to talk about how they went through a process of designing a shared measurement system in Calgary. Tim? Well, good morning or uh, afternoon, I guess, depends on, on where all of you are, but uh, it's very exciting uh, for me to be, uh, uh, to be part of it. I, I honestly feel like I should be uh, listening in and not presenting. We have as much to learn, I think, as we do um, to share. But um, in, in Calgary's case, uh, collective impact and shared measurement to me uh, are one and the same thing. And it's, it, in our experience, it's been absolutely critical to have the shared measurement uh, as part of our uh, collective impact um, process. And the, the process of shared measurement really helped us uh, organize ourselves in order to in order to achieve our collective impact goal. And shared measurement, I think it's really important, certainly from our perspective anyway, it's really important that we take shared measurement out of a, um, shared measurement out of the um, sort of realm of evaluation and into the realm of being at the heart of the collective impact. And uh, it's more than evaluation. For us, it's including, it helps us organize our homelessness system of care and coordinate the action of all of those uh, different uh, different agencies. So in Calgary, uh, just by way of background, uh, Calgary had Canada's fastest growing homeless population. Uh, 2006 it was about 3,500. 2008 it was about 4,000 people. And a point in time count, we estimate between 15 and 17,000 different people per year. Uh, we're a city of about a million. That led us to the creation of a 10-year plan to end homelessness. Many of you in the States will be familiar with uh, this, uh, this concept. We uh, borrowed it from uh, our American friends. Our goal is uh, by 2018, no person spends more than seven days in emergency shelter between, uh, before moving into a safe, uh, decent, affordable housing. Um, and our, our committee that built this was, uh, was sort of a community committee of, of you know, 25 leaders and over 100 volunteers, and that ranged uh, across the sector. A lot of the unusual suspects you wouldn't normally expect involved in homelessness, ranging from the normal agencies to the private sector, faith leaders, three levels of government, Aboriginal leaders, and, and many others. But it's important to note the, the kind of complexity that we were working with. Um, Faye mentioned the 10,000 other um, there were about 10,000 different data points that all the agencies were looking at. We are, uh, we had, I think, 140 nonprofit agencies, eight provincial government departments, um, at least the federal government as well, and over 2,000 programs, all sort of part of our homelessness system of care. And slowly but surely, 
we are working at uh, beginning to integrate all of those uh, moving parts. The Homeless Foundation is what FSD is referred to as a backbone uh, organization where system planner, funder, funder, researcher, advocate, and affordable housing uh, developer and owner. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. So the, the big question is uh, how, do you, how do we go about um, putting in place a shared measurement system? Uh, and if I'm perfectly honest with you, uh, when we got started, we had absolutely no idea uh, how or where to get started. We knew we needed to measure progress. We knew we needed to organize our system of care. Uh, and we had no idea how. And we sort of backed into all of that system organization and system planning and coordination through the development of our shared measurement exercise. Now, Calgary had the benefit of borrowing on years of experience um, in the United States. So uh, the U.S. Uh, Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development had uh, mandates HMIS systems. We were able to hire a consultant in the U.S. called Canavan Associates to uh, help us work through it. We were also able to work with the U.S. National Alliance to End Homelessness. So if any of you are, uh, are in the same homelessness space that we are, I would recommend those resources. But our process was really uh, six steps. First, we created a community advisory committee, and this was kind of revolutionary in our thinking because, uh, the, it, as it turns out, user and consumer involvement is absolutely critical to the development of effective shared measurements. So the agencies that were using this, including homeless people who are going to be uh, have their information put into the system, were all part of developing it. All of the decisions made were made uh, as a committee, so that was uh, really important. The second step then is we began to conceptualize what a homeless management information system could do. And we got our heads around the idea that it's way more than just simply counting noses or counting people who are being housed or, or uh, you know, doing that typical funder reporting and evaluation. And, and so we worked through together what it is, what it was, what it could do, uh, how it would figure into all of this, uh, into our homeless system. And we were able to, uh, we had a, a collaborative discussion, transparent discussion. Um, we had a consistent process across the community which made, uh, which helped us all get on the same page. And too often, you know, we jump to what the technology is for, for evaluation or for shared measurement. But the process and the alignment and the thinking through what the system was supposed to do was way more important um, than any other aspect. The technology is actually quite easy. The third point was uh, once we got our heads around what it could do, what it needed to do, we figured out what the governance would be. And again, um, we, we, the people who were inputting the data and the people whose data was being input we're all part of agreeing on how the system would be governed. The Homeless Foundation itself, we, we, ha we hire an employee, the administrator that runs the system, but we, the system is, in my perspective anyway, owned by the community and by the agencies who are um, putting the information in. And that gives, that, that empowerment, I think, is leading to really significant uptake and, um, and really good outcomes uh, from, from its use. Um, the system design again. The, 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 once you decided, you know what we needed to measure and why we needed to measure, that forced a lot of questions in terms of how do agencies fit together? What do what do we agree is important to measure? How do we manage the handoffs and coordination between the agency? And so we ended up, you know, moving our taking all of those different programs and shifting them into eight basic program types. And from that, we developed eight key outcomes and we'll discuss those in a sec. The last, uh, the fifth step is that software vendor selection. Again, that was near the end, you'll notice. Uh, the vendor selection, the technology, you, you know, you've got to do a sort of form follows function exercise where we got to figure out what we needed to do for who and under what terms and then work out what technology will support the system need. Uh, and that, again, uh, was done through a competitive process through requests for proposals, and the, the, the vendor was selected um, by the Community Advisory Committee. And finally, monitoring and feedback. Again, we've, uh, 10-year plans to end homelessness, 
really are, are they're not concrete and and you have to work through you constant sort of evolution uh, to figure out how to evolve your system and how to respond to the world as it changes around you and the uh, and same goes for um, the HMIS and we're uh, again going we have a process of continual improvement in our shared measurement uh, next slide please so in in, uh, in Calgary we have uh, we have shared measures and we have agreed uh, system outcomes that the HMIS system helps us track. And we divided those into two basic types of measures, system measures and program measures. And the system measures help us figure out how the system of care is functioning, how uh, all of the agencies are working as that, as that collective, and there's a good sense of success in, in uh, reducing homelessness. And the program measures are how do you, you know what are the what are the critical success measures of individual programs? And again, what was really helpful in this process is that we all came, we all sort of came together and figured out what was really critical. What do we need to know to know that we were in fact ending homelessness? That the system as a system was functioning well together, the system of care and the program uh, measures, so that we knew that the programs within that system uh, were were functioning well. And so how we're using the HMIS, uh, the information coming out of it, we're using for system planning, development, and evolution. We have a 10-year plan, and we have an annual implementation plan uh, all the way uh, every year. So we do strategy review and a business plan every year, uh, and we shift to meet things uh, as the world changes or we find out we're doing something right or wrong, and um, the HMIS data is critical to that. Um, and that is ties into responding real-time to changes in homelessness. We use it for program monitoring, quality improvement. We have a hardwired system here of uh, quality improvement in terms of program uh, and system delivery. The HMIS helps us do that. I mentioned the annual strategic review. And the, the data coming from the system also allows us to uh, figure out what, um, what investments to make and what's a good, uh, what's a good investment. Um, from our perspective, and, and again, the data because the system is owned by everybody. Everybody will be part of reviewing the data that's in the system, so we get a sense of how things are changing together. Um, next slide, please. And finally, I think uh, you know I'm just sort of wrapping up on the um, what what are the key learnings for us. Um, first of all, that that systems focus on alignment, and you know the, the the key to I think collective impact is having having uh, is system planning and you can't really do system planning without system measurement and um, and alignment and the shared measurement process created by going through an HMIS process for us uh, led to a rethinking of plan imp implementation and helped us structure our homeless system of care. Community engagement again this was a very democratic process and if I'm if I'm perfectly honest um, it was there was way more community engagement and involvement and ownership than I was initially uh, comfortable with because I, I thought we would uh, turn into a, a four-alarm goat rodeo with so many different people involved. But at the end of the day, that community engagement was key to making the, the system work. The other key element was access to everybody, so we made the technology training and cost accessible to everybody, equitable between big agencies and small agencies. Um, and that was important. The, the, I think the most important learning for me, and this is something that is counterintuitive, I think, for many governments and for many uh, agencies, is that when you're talking about shared measurement, technology is totally secondary. The process, the structure, thinking through what you need the technology to do is, uh, is your first consideration. And the technology supports what the process requires and what the measurement requires. So if if there's any if you take nothing else out of you know my little chunk of this presentation today, remember that technology is second, form follows uh function. And last is uh, the one of the aha moments for me is uh you know we talked a lot you know as agencies and, and service delivery organizations and governments there's a lot of concern about privacy but I found um as we as we peeled back the layers of the onion, um, privacy was not being done very well in many parts of our many parts of our system, and uh, many agencies 
uh, and many and many folks were, were were seeming to use privacy to mask worry over scrutiny and say, well, we can't talk about these things because there's client privacy. And, and what they're, I think what they were really saying is, I don't want to talk about these things because uh, I'm worried about how it'll look and how it'll look to my funder and how it'll look to the community, and and I just don't want to uh, don't want to change. But again. Um, the introducing the system and shared measurement and broad uh, data collection is actually going to enhance consumer uh, privacy. And in fact, the consumers were all over the idea of an HMIS. And that uh, is all for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. And I think it's a, a great example and, and also how you're framing it, that this is not just about evaluation, but truly about a way to organize a system and help the different stakeholders to coordinate better together. Um, also, we're seeing a lot of questions from the audience around your comments around the system being owned by the different stakeholders and the importance of community engagement and ownership. So we'd love to come back to some of those questions in the Q&A uh, portion of our webinar. But now I'd love to shift over to Pat Bowie from the Magnolia Place Initiative in Los Angeles. And she's going to focus on the use of shared measurement. Um, they were able to put shared measures in place, and now they have a really structured process around how different stakeholders can work together on learning from that data. So Pat? Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, one, I, I want to just take a moment and give a little bit of background and context to the Magnolia Initiative. But again, uh, as Tay just mentioned, the focus of my remarks will be about building for where Tim has left off. So Tim highlighted the need to develop a shared purpose, a shared agreement about the work, and agreeing to the shared measures of success. We, my remarks are going to highlight the tools and the structure we use to go from having data to using data to get to results. I do want to actually also put in the caveat that we are in our own learning process with this, so my comments are about what we have done, where we're headed, and what we've learned so far. So first and foremost, the Magnolia Place Community Initiative is about getting to a population level change, meaning what is now currently 70 plus partners have made a commitment to the 35,000 children living within a five square mile, 500 block area in Metro LA. The goal is that these children will break all records of success in their education and health and the quality of nurturing care and economic stability they receive from their families and communities. Participation in the initiative is voluntary. There is no monetary incentives. Folks are asked to coordinate and align their efforts using their current resources, their current capacities, and their interests. It's based on what we see emerging actually about peer production. So it's about encouraging peer contribution, cooperation and sharing, and the alignment of efforts. One important note to make um, that while the traditional service focus has been on mitigating risk or risk reduction, this particular initiative is committed to promoting and achieving well-being for children, families, and the community. In order to promote and sustain well-being, everyone is committed to building a culture of connection and belonging. So therefore, the initiative is driven forward by strengthening relationships among and between community members, community groups, and organizations. Next slide. So having gone through the process similar to the one that Tim describes, what we have done is we have taken the theory of change that we developed and our agreed upon measures and developed a data dashboard. So for us, the data dashboard is a visual representation not only of this theory of change, but it also is an ability for us to, to put in front of us a tracking for our progress. And this is a progress towards achieving our goals. The dashboard is a tool that allows us to see on a regular basis, ultimately, are we doing what we said we would do, and are these actions getting us to our intended results? The top part of the dashboard displays our long-term outcomes. For us, this is third grade reading scores and measures of kindergarten readiness. These outcomes serve as proxies for child well-being. They're not a reflection of what everyone is focused on doing. Instead, they are measures that tell us if our collective efforts are starting to make a difference on generally agreed upon measures for children's success. As we move down the page, the outcomes that are displayed are, are shorter term. These are indicators that demonstrate we are heading towards successful attainment of our long-term goals. 
So the short-term indicators should be achieved in our estimation. We should be able to achieve uh, improvement in a matter of years, while the long-term outcomes may take a decade. And so the top portion is, is the outcomes, and then below the outcomes are what we call the run charts, or what are called the run charts. And these reflect the actions that the partners are committed to taking and that they believe are the necessary first steps in beginning to achieve the positive change in the top part of the outcome. The run charts reflect the goals based on the agreed upon approach to the work. So we gather the data for the run charts on a regular basis, monthly from organizations and quarterly from the community. And honestly, this is about as real time as we can manage. The dashboard is generated quarterly. So organizational data is displayed within the sectors. So um, sectors for us include health, early childhood education, we have family support, which also even includes banks. It's kind of everybody else, and the community at large. So again, just want to say this is a tool that allows us to see whether we are doing what we said we would do and did we begin to see a positive change toward our agreed upon goals. What this doesn't do, however, is it doesn't actually tell us what to do to make an improvement. Next slide, please. So the process that we are using to actually move towards improvement is the model for improvement. And this is based on the work of Edward Deming. And it's a, it's a disciplined approach that asks, what are you trying to accomplish? How would we know that a change is an improvement? And what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? Then you begin to test those change ideas using cycles of small-scale tests and um, that build sequentially on one another towards that promising and testing out that promising idea. It's Plan, Do, Study, Act, or PDSA is what we call it. The goal is to learn what works without disrupting the system and without the need and, and getting stifled by, it, in, in all honesty, um, requiring consensus for every action that you take. So we are looking to achieve change at, at three levels, at the individual practice level within organizations themselves and, and across agencies and sectors to improve how we function as a system. The environment we're currently using to get to shared learning and alignment is to bring folks together on a monthly basis. Um, we call it a move the dot meeting. So each of the organizations receive their individual run chart data at this monthly meeting, and these are the results that are based on surveys capturing parents' experience with care. Again, this, this isn't evaluation data. It doesn't mean any kind of reliability or validity standards, but it is data that tests the system by asking for parents' experiences of what the organizational folks, what everyone agreed that they would do. So organizations then take a look at their data and share with each other what they're doing and what they, what they have going on that may be working, and they use that as an encouragement to others about what might actually work for them, what they might try. And then organizations come together and they explore and plan actions that they can try either individually or with another agency to successfully implement a portion or a piece of our agreed upon approach. So some examples of the current PDSA efforts, just to give you a context, so, you know, there right now it includes, you know, can the Magnolia Network service and referral form be used in all well-child visits? Does screening and assessment and a care team approach for maternal depression increase screening and response? Does a warm handoff or personal introduction between the county department staff and city family source program result in more timely linkage than a typical referral? Can Children's Nature Institute organize neighborhood walks with USC Eisner families that link with risk-based health promotion over weight reduction efforts of their clinic-based occupational therapists? And does parent activation at a WIC center, meaning discussing developmental concerns at the 24-month recertification, link concerned parents to several network partners that can be responsive to child development concerns? So the key is folks keep exploring and testing and, and moving towards understanding how to make a more 
a, an effective system function around the standard approach to get ultimately to the results that we seek. Next slide, please. So our key findings thus far is that real-time data actually really does, it provides a way to test about hypotheses, learn what's working and not working and why. So we're not waiting just in a year's time to take a look at, at our outcome measures and, and wonder what did we actually do to make a change or not and what changed or not. This is speeding that process up and having some intentionality. And what we found is folks are really excited to get their data back and see how they're doing. And why and how that is is that we put, we put absolute attention to establishing a culture of cooperation and sharing. And this part is actually really critical. You know, data is not for criticism, but it is for critical reflection and learning. So our, our, the structure for learning, you know, what we really have found is it, it does require intentionality and consistency. For us, um, the model for improvement really has provided a useful discipline around that, that, you know, it's important and critical to establish norms that support learning and alignment of efforts. So a structure and a consistency where partners attend meetings, they bring their data to a meeting and they get data back at that very same meeting. It's a promise and a mutuality towards everyone and people coming to that meeting know that they can gain support and coaching. And so what we've also found is we're, we're evolving our structure that really focus on creating the right environment for sharing, learning, and coaching. And that's an ongoing check-in check for us as it's a, what I think they would say is one of the critical pieces of a backbone organization is to, to provide that support. So the other piece that's really critical is motivating and engagement for change. You know, most folks, you know, have a lot of ideas that they've actually never had the opportunity to test or try. And in fact, what we have found with a lot of folks in various, depending on the organizational structure, it could be a bureaucracy, many times they're not even ever asked what actually might make a difference. So what we're trying to do and are doing is tapping into that intrinsic desire that people have to want to make a difference and want to contribute. And we know that, and we have seen, that people are more committed to what they've been a part of creating. So again, and the critical piece of strategic alignment is, you know, is getting to that population level change that we seek, you know, or getting to success in any kind of a, a complex endeavor, isn't about the right service, the right strategy, or, or just one planning process. You know, what is really required and what we, we keep struggling and adapting and, and moving towards is a structure that supports learning and includes a process and tools that support and deepen the commitment to changing the way we connect and work with one another that will ultimately get us to our intended results. So that's it for my comments. Great. Thank you so much, Pat. And I think you're right that there's sort of a, a mindset shift that has to happen around data being not being used for criticism, but really being used for learning. Uh, and I think the, the processes and tools you all have been able to provide for the Magnolia Place initiative are a great example. So we'd now like to turn to the Q&A portion of the webinar and thank you all so much for the many, many questions that we are receiving um, around sort of both pieces, both putting measures in place as well as using shared measurement systems. Um, and I'd like to start with a, sort of the question around how to get this in place. We've gotten a lot of questions around this broad and open engagement. How do you actually make that happen? Um, and Tim, you spoke um, very much about the community engagement piece of this being much larger than you anticipated. A lot of our listeners are curious how you were able to engage a broad range of stakeholders um, and what, you know, sort of what challenges you encountered. A lot of folks are asking questions about, you know, were, were providers afraid of comparison, for example, um, and how did you get around that, particularly as, as a funder? So perhaps, Tim, if you could take that question around stakeholder engagement and how you manage that process and key okay. challenges. Um, well, there, there's a, a bunch of different levels to this. I think what's, what was really helpful for us is that we had we had pretty broad agreement on the collective impact goal. Like, we were, we were aligned in order to end 
uh, homelessness, and we we have that we have that um, helping us sort of frame the conversation. If you had a lot more uh, sort of nebulous focus, the community engagement I think would be a lot more challenging. The second, the other consideration I think is that while we we did have an open, um, uh, we had a fairly open sort of process. We had a lot of people around the table. We also tried to ensure that the structure was quite uh, was quite rigorous and and we had some discipline around uh, clarity on the structure of the process so that uh, it was well facilitated. And it, we typically would go into discussions uh, with proposals and options as opposed to an open-ended conversation uh, around certain elements. But again, it was a it's sort of a constant process of you know education, discussion, uh, revision, discussion, decision kind of uh, stuff. Um, in terms of you know getting around so where where some of the concern would be on the sharing of information, um, that's why early on the governance discussions came into play, and we agreed as a community what could and couldn't be shared. Now we are a, a major funder in the homelessness system. And, of course, a lot of people were concerned about how we're going to use the information. And so we agreed to rules uh, on the policies, on the use of that uh, data um, that the rest of the system agreed to. So we don't have uh, unilateral ability to just to publish all kinds of information about how the homeless system is functioning. We don't have um, uh, freedom to publish data from the HMIS about how specific agencies are performing without that agency's consent. So we manage, you know, we the process allowed us to hear people's concerns, respond to their concerns, and, and you know, build that engagement. And you know, and I th I've seen another question here about the role of uh, funders. Well, the funders were uh, mo most of the funders were at the table for this uh, for this conversation, and um, and we have uh, uh, one of the th one of the things that's on offer for the participating agencies was that the system would help us um, would sort of help. Uh, reduce the burden, the administrative burden on agencies by uh, streamlining some of that reporting into funders, and so um, that also uh, was a, an appealing part of the of process. That's great. So really, having a clear common agenda as a starting point, you know, being able to bring straw man to different stakeholders to provide, you know, feedback, clear governance, and really how you structure the system itself, right, in terms of the access to information. Mm -hmm. um, Pat, I'd love for you to weigh in on this as well. I know you were talking much more about sort of the use of data, but when you think about key success factors for you know, developing the measures uh, for Magnolia Place, did you see common key success factors in LA? Would you add any to that list? Well, I think Tim is right, and I, and I think, um, honestly, his, his initial remarks even about that the process is more important than the web technology, because in that process actually starts to develop that culture change that we talked about, that the data is going to come back, that it is about learning, you know, that, that it is a shared experience. But I have to honestly admit, the first time people saw their data, you know, was, you know, that data can't be true, who took that data, you know, all those fear factors and anxiety factors is, you know, what is this a measure of, and who decided on these questions in the first place, and these measures, which they did, actually. Um, but it's that first reaction that we all have and that, you know, it, it's through that process of, of, you know, folks having to sit back and, and having the trust to say, well, you know, well, we did, right? And, well, you know, I, you know, we had actually an experience where the Child Support Services Division got their, their data back and, and said, well, why would we actually be concerned about or asking families about stressors and, you know, we, you know, we're child support, we deal with child support, and, you know, we can't be held accountable, especially if we're going to ask about, you know, how the mom is feeling. And then they looked next, and then they looked at the, the data of the organization sitting next to them, and they were 98% on that rating of, of being able to ask families about stressors and getting that report back. And then they just turned and said, hey, how did you do that? And then the the other organization just said, well, this is how we do it. And they said, oh, we'll be willing to try that. I guess it isn't so far. So we're, it's creating the, the space that allows people to, to kind of have their reaction and, and recognize there is and recognize this is really for your learning, for your purpose. 
in our dashboard when we go out, that's part of why we put the data into sectors. You know, people get their individual data and they use that at, in their community of learning because they all know what that data is. And then the dashboard that might go out more publicly, there's, there's a little more anim anim anonymity attached to that because the data gets collected and, and plotted out in, within sectors. So there's multiple organizations' data that gets demonstrated within that. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great. And I think it just underlines the importance of having that broad engagement in developing those measures so that when you actually get the data back, as you're describing, people are willing to look at it um, and engage with it rather than say, no, nope, this is not the measure that I agreed to or this has nothing to do with me. Um, and that's a really good point. <clears throat> We've also gotten some questions about how to deal with resistance um, really at the beginning of developing a system. So I'm curious if either of you had either funders or providers that really said, you know, I'm not interested in participating in a shared measurement system, and if so, how you were able to deal with that. Well, uh, in Calgary's experience, we certainly do. I mean, um, we don't have the we don't have the whole system involved. What we've designed, what we've been doing is implementing the system in, in phases. And so we have our first phase was 25 agencies. Our second phase will be about 25 or 30 agencies. Many um, wanted to see, are sort of waiting to see how it works um, before they commit. And so, and that's fine. Uh, but the, the key to, I, I think one of the keys to dealing with that resistance is to be as transparent uh, as we can. Right, and that's that's something we've seen in other examples as well. Is if you can start with a core uh, of of stakeholders that can agree to developing the shared measurement system, you can often bring others along as you go. Um, but being really clear about the process and, and keeping it open um, is a real key to success. Well, that's that's, great. that's been fundamental for us as well. So I would totally echo that. And part of the process too is. Um, it, it, it fits for us in terms of our, our culture around learning, around start small and actually learn, work out some of the kinks, and then bring and spread. So it, it's a modeling of that same model for improvement for us so we don't start. Even if we had everyone saying, yeah, we're ready, we know we're not ready to have, you know, 70-plus partners jump in and do this process all at once that would rather work out the kinks in, in, in just like Tim said, in phases. So we actually were intentional about creating those phases, going with those folks who had the enthusiasm, they're ready, they're ready, and knowing that they were going to help us test out the system. That was, you know, so it wasn't that they expected a perfect process when they went in, that they're part of all aspects of learning how to do this together. So we have a lot of very practical listeners on the webinar, um, and there are a lot of questions around, you know, how long does this take? It's clearly a very iterative process, and, and it moves in phases, as well as how much does it cost, uh, and who foots the bill for a shared measurement system. Would you all like to address that, Tim? Do you want to go first in terms of just how long this process took in Calgary and, and the rough cost associated with it? Uh, well, there's, there's kind of a good news, bad news story. The good news is the, the first part of the process, you know, the, the alignment took about a year. Uh, I think yeah, the bad news is I'm not sure it'll end <laughs> because there's a lot of, uh, you know, we're, ongoing development, ongoing implementation. Probably by the end of our, you know, in the next six years of, the, of our 10-year plan, we'll have it fully uh, fully implemented. But, again, it's, it's going to live on beyond the end of our, uh, our plan to end homelessness. Right now, the... Um, I, I believe the cost um, just to get started for the licenses and the process. I think we were we were looking at about um, seven or eight hundred thousand dollars over a period of about three years. Great. And Pat, would you um, can you give an estimate first of time and cost for the Magnolia Place initiative? Well, we've approached this in, in an entirely different way. So uh, the process in terms of time is quite similar. Um, it, you know, we have those goal areas laid out. We know what, you know, success looks like for kids. Those are agreed upon, right? But really getting to an agreement around a theory of change, what was going to measure, that that took a year. And I, and I agree with Tim. I, it, it's an ever-evolving an emergent process as people really start to become intentional about it. You you know, you have to revisit what that thinking was, you know, where are you with that? Um and you know, and really getting clear that this was an agreed upon approach 
not just in terms of how we're going to do measures, that we're actually going to capture data, that we're going to be intentional about it, but that this was an approach that we actually think is going to get to the result that we see, and that's what we're testing. And, and people do kind of come back and learn and revisit. So it is an iterative process, but absolutely it took us about a year to get clear on the approach and the measures, but then it also took us a good six months to nine months to set up this process whereby um, everyone, and, you know, we had learning sessions around the model for improvement. We, you know, developed the parent voice of the system, which is these monthly um, um, parent surveys, and um, tested those out, tested out how do you get the data back, what does that all look like. That took us another six to nine months. And actually, I feel like we are now in, in the spread of all of that. So, you know, we have really solid, um, good trend line data at, cause, uh, for our community data and organizations. Some organizations have that, but they'll be learning and going. But it takes a good four to five months to know, even when they're collecting that data, that it, it, it's being done reliably. The cost is a little different for us in that we don't have a funder. This is voluntary. We are asking folks to bring their expertise. So in terms of the expertise and support that we have around the data is one of the partners. Um, so where the county now has come in is taking a look at that, and they actually are are going, well, now we're at a place that we've worked out the system. Maybe we can invest some money and actually create this and, and do what Tim is saying, actually think about kind of making an investment in what this could mean and what this would cost overall. But we, we, you know, it is very, very different in terms of peer production. So the costs are the time and the resources that people are using. They're using their expertise and what they do in order to align and coordinate to make this happen for everyone. Yep, that's great. And I, I think that that's important to sort of recognize and going back to your point, Tim, about it's not the technology that's important. <laughs> it's the process and bringing the stakeholders together. And Magnolia Place is a great example of that, where you all have a ton of data, but you don't necessarily have a sophisticated web-based system in place at this point, although it's something that you might be considering putting in place. And I think just from, you know, from our work at looking across multiple um, shared measurement systems, you know, the kind of ranges that we've seen are very similar to what you all have, have mentioned. So really taking um, anywhere from a year to two years to even go through that initial phase of getting to a common agenda and shared measures, and then another phase of really, you know, as Pat's describing, putting the learning processes in place. Um, and then cost, you know, running from sort of 300,000 largely in kind and people's time to um, upwards of 2 million for a very sophisticated um, uh, system. So again, those are the kinds of ranges, but I think both of you are speaking to the need for commitment up front of the actors that will be engaged in this um, and just the time that the process takes for itself. Um, which actually leads me to the next set of questions that we're getting from our webinar uh, listeners around the role of the backbone organization. <clears throat> and it's no um, coincidence that both of you are essentially playing the backbone role for the shared measurement systems um, around your issues. So Calgary Homeless Foundation, obviously in Calgary, and Magnolia Place is essentially the backbone um, in Los Angeles. Um, and there are so many different roles that you all have been playing. I think it would be helpful for folks maybe to spell out a little bit about, you know, as the backbone, what does that mean? What, what roles are you playing versus others? Um, and, and sort of what kind of commitment has that meant for you in playing that backbone role? Pat, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, you know, it's a, um, we, the backbone organization for us is, um, is not a specific organization, but it is function and roles, just like you were, you were saying, Faye. So, you know, in many ways, um, you know, my role, like to say I'm a consultant isn't really a good, um, it's not a good title, and we're struggling with that. And, you know, what, because what it really is, is, is um, working, there is a Magnolia um, Place Community Initiative Director, and there are key organizations, such as the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities, that runs the data for us, the CEO mm -hmm. um, office from the county that actually moves through and the services and supports function. So as people have their institutional roles, they become and play a function that's critical within what holds this whole thing together. 
And then my role, along with Lila, the directors, is to constantly be in check with the partners, um, constantly creating investing on the coaches that we have that support the various pieces, collecting that data, bringing that in. You know, I, you know it's um, cheerleader, it's nudge, um, it's, you know, going and really helping people work through their challenges and their conflicts with things. It's a, it's a lot of that relationship building, the human, the human part of change, supporting the human, and at the same time keeping and thinking about what is the environment and structures for learning, what are the tools that we have to do it. We don't have a web-based system, but we absolutely use um, shared platforms for people to communicate, share what they're doing, um, foster that relationship building. So um, there are absolutely key roles that have to, to take place in terms of holding and putting that data, translating data, bringing in new ideas, new knowledge, new information, and facilitating that ongoing environment for learning, coordination, and alignment. Um, I would say those are the critical components. That's great. And I think just, again, underlines the importance of having a backbone organization that really is dedicated to um, bringing folks together around shared measurements and supporting the learning. Tim, did you have some comments on the backbone role in Calgary? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's very similar to uh, what uh, Pat was talking about. Uh, but for us, we're a little bit different in that we're also a major funder of the system. So we fund a number of the programs, uh, and we're requiring those programs to be part of the, the shared measurement process. But again, it's um, the implementation of the HMIS goes way beyond just the programs and systems that, that we're funding. One of the, you know, we provide, you know, we, per, we raised the money, we provided the funding to put the shared measurement system in place. But one of the things, um, you know, beyond that we did was we actually are putting in place shared measurement despite pressure from our government funders to the contrary. Um, because they are, they have a traditional sort of evaluation and measurement framework, um, and we had to kind of act as a buffer in our community to those uh, programs funded by the government, um, and we had to work on uh, figuring out uh, how do we ensure we can do shared measurement and coordination in the fashion we know we need to when our major funder, um, the government of Alberta, wasn't quite there yet, and so. Uh, we were kind of the troubleshooter and uh, and buffer um, for our agencies uh, as well. But we, um, you know, from a, a more practical perspective, we currently uh, we employ the HMIS administrator. There are three people. Uh, we have three full-time staff that work on the HMIS and in terms of the deployment and implementation and training and uh, making sure the data is all uh, together and managing the process and including uh, analysis of the data that uh, that we see on the on the system. That's great. So just a real commitment of, of resources and time, but obviously with with a big payoff. So I think we're, we're really at our, at our time now in such a rich discussion. Thank you both so much for sharing with us all your wonderful examples of um, really being able to put shared measurement systems in place and use them. Uh, shared measurement is clearly just one of the five key conditions of collective impact. All of the components are important, but we are so excited about some of the emerging models that we're seeing in the field around shared measurement and the implications that they have for all of our work. The Calgary 10-year plan and homelessness and Magnolia Place are two wonderful examples. We've seen lots of other examples in the field. And we understand that many of you in the audience may just be getting started with thinking about your own shared measurement. And so we're really glad that you're able to join us uh, for the webinar. This is clearly not easy work. It's not simple. It's not quick. But it really is a way to get at solving complex social problems and getting to large-scale social change. So I'd just like to thank all of you for joining today, in particular just to really thank Pat and Tim for sharing your lessons learned with all of us. And I hope that all of you have been able to take away some practical lessons from our discussion today. Um, just so you know, the materials from today's webinar will be on FSG's website as well as the webinar website. And you can find some additional resources around collective impact and shared measurement on our FSG website as well. So thank you all for joining, and have a wonderful day. Take care.